in South Korea, the, the adoption of a child was never a, a judicial process without any you know, intervention of public authorities, administrative bodies or courts. So just a private decision. Right. I, I guess a lot of puts a lot of responsibility on the people involved because they might be motivated by many things. There's no watchdog or authority to look over those behaviors or actions. So that would be a bad thing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, without any uh, public, you know, public authorities determination. So it is only, you know, private adoption is illegal, has been international standard since 1960s. Yeah. Just because it's too dangerous for children. You know, even you, even, you know, those children are your own. You cannot give those children to other people as you want. If even if you want, and, and even if you think that, the, you know, those people or, or those facilities can really take care of that ch this child well, but you cannot yeah. give them away. Yeah, there has to be a legal body that makes yeah. that decision. And they should okay. be under the, you know, protection, child protection system, which is public, which is run, run by public authorities. So in the in the 1980s in South Korea, it was still private? Adoption was private until 2012 in South Korean legal system. Yes. 2012. 2012. That's such part of our yes. modern history, modern yes. life. Yeah, less than a decade. So this is, yes, this is about family law. So in, in you know, in other countries, in many countries, family law has its so, you know, traditional aspect because, you know, it is so difficult to change, you know, traditional law. And family law is among, you know, other legal system. It is restricted and so strict, you know, so resistant to changes into the modern, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> modern times. So it is not only, you know, difficulties in South Korea, but it is also that in, in, in most European countries, the development of a child protection system, which is, you know, when we see the child protection system mm -hmm. is that uh, basically, you know, the private realm in, in, your, in, in your privacy, yeah. you, you think that uh, you can make a decision on your privacy as you want. Mm -hmm. You want to lead your life and lead your family as you believe. So that is privacy, hmm. but the development of a welfare state or the development of you know, the it, uh, human rights norms, you need to, the state needs to protect the vulnerable members of the family who are women and children. So it is a good thing, though, that South Korea has done that. I mean, we can often sort of say that it was much later and South Korea has its own history, its own as I'm sure you're well aware, but the, South Korea's experience of the 20th century with colonialism and civil war and authoritarian is yeah. very different from what was happening yeah. in, in France yes. or Norway or Switzerland. So it is a good thing that even though it was as late as 2012, that system has come into place. Uh, but it is too Korea. late because we did have, you know, have chance to <laughs> develop, you know, so mm. it is so tragic or so unfortunate that South Korea never put its priority on the protection of the rights of the mm. child. Was there a reason for that? Was it more focused on economic development? Was there, was there this culture that sort of made it taboo? Or why was that, in your opinion? Why was it so late? Why was there not enough attention on the children? Yeah, I think there are very multiple layers <laughs> multiple layers of prejudice and discrimination and there are so many things but you know back to your question about whether you know this issue yeah. is involved with the economic interests of the you know uh, of the policy makers or political powers at the time uh, this issue is not only about south korea it is about the, the, the receiving countries the United States, the biggest receiving country of the mm. world. The United States is really, you know, adopting uh, children, has been adopting children from almost yeah. 100 countries. It is so diverse. But uh, South Korea was always very, you know, huge number and top five countries 
uh, to send ch uh, children to the United States. And when we see the, the issues that discussed with adoption uh, in such Western countries, it is about making your family. If you cannot have your own birth, birth child, mm -hmm. so it is about, you know, uh, test tube, you know, kind of right. treatment. Yeah, IVF and uh, adoption, uh, even surrogacy. Yeah, so these things are, you know, connected issues uh, discussed mm -hmm. in those Western receiving countries. And in right. South Korea, adoption is talked among the issues uh, like uh, orphans, unwed mothers, or even abortion. So it's more taboo here, isn't it? The, the concept or the, the discussion, it feels like the discussion around adoption in South Korea is associated more with negativity or there, there's some feeling about it that makes it uncomfortable. Or, you know, it is about the perspective of human being, I think. Mm. Human being who is more valued and who are less valued. Yeah. So it is really really inhumane thing to say that yeah. uh, but a human it, it, so it is not only a children or adoption it is about the human rights and about human being and about the humanity for all if you know some human being is considered as less valued and can be you know get rid of from the society and sent out even out of the country, not only, mm. you know, out of family, but out of the country, that really uh, reveals that how this country to treat it, human being. Something of a paradox, because Korea is that collective, that uri, that tanil minjok, that, that kind of, we associate Korea right. with ideas of family and having a position inside a family, whether we call it Confucianism or traditional culture, but that feels very real. So it seems like a paradox that this would be happening more in Korea than in other, let's say, more individual focused societies. Yes. And the really horrible thing to say about the procedure of adoption from South Korea is that to make those children adoptable, which means in a lot, uh, eligible yeah. for adoption, uh, this country choose the the methodology, the method to make them orphans. Yeah. So adoption tran transitional adoption procedure is directly connected with the birth registration process. And this would be the the like the Hoju system, the family system. And for a, for a long time, right. women yeah. couldn't be the head of the family by themselves, could they? That's quite a recent change yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, that's why, you know, I am saying that the Hoju system, so-called yeah. Hoju system of South Korea did. So many people believe that Hoju system ended in 2008 in South Korea, but that's not the truth. But what that's is not the truth. Because by law it did, but what is the reality? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you know the, the word mm. huju uh, disappeared mm. in the family law Mimpa, of South Korea. But basically, you know, the, the idea and the system. The huju system means is patriarchy yeah. system, patriarchal system uh, in South Korea. Patriarchal system means that uh, the head of family, the head of family, patriarchy, has the power to make a decision to, to give them uh, uh, under the Hoju system. Hoju, the birth registration means uh, registered into a family. Into, yeah, registered as a member of, uh, of the family. Yeah, if you cannot be the member of the family, if the head of a family does not... Uh, allow you to be the member of the family you cannot be registered to the state so you're just left in a limbo in this kind of no man's land right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but that birth register registration system really did not change in 2008 when you know people believe Hoju system was abolished because, you know, uh, still the birth registration in South Korea is the obligation of the parents. 
So if the parents, so it is up to the decision of the parents whether you'd register your child or not. There is not, you know, public intervention mm -hmm. so far to make that, to guarantee that a life born in, in, in this country to be registered. Looking through some of the literature, there's the the, the hojok system or where you become the head of your own family? Mm -hmm. Yes, and in many countries, in many countries, birth registration is basically, you know, yeah. individual registration. Yeah, but still in South Korea, it's family mm -hmm. registration. Yeah. Individual should be registered to, you know, fam family lecture. One thing that I often struggle with is how much of it is legal how much of it is based on the law and you you know you point out that even though the law changed in 2008 the reality might be different and how much of it is cultural attitudes and society's view towards let's say uh single mothers or um or for, because that must play a role in it somehow mustn't it, it, it it's not just e economic and legal yeah yes and still uh, when you register your child in, in, in the process of birth registration into the yep. wedlock, so birth, birth into the legal marriage and birth out of mm. legal marriage is still legally divided. Do you have you know experience to register, you, you yep. know, report your child children's birth yeah. in South Korea? Yeah, both our children are registered, yeah. Then, yeah, so if, if you see the mm. paper, there should be you know a, 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 a box to check whether this baby is born into the wedlock or out of wedlock you know kind of things yeah yeah there's still you know discrimination and prejudice mm. is law yeah. here in south korea so you know until 2012 uh, the children goes to you know, the children that were, who were adopted overseas, who were adopted out of the country, uh, their birth report was done as mm -hmm. orphan. So this country, yeah, at the, at, the, at the stage, at the step of birth registration is, you know, public and official yeah. document. So this, but this official document is fake. It was a lie. Whether you know that who is your, who are their, these babies, these children's real parents, uh, the government doesn't care, didn't care. They just, to, you know, registered the children as orphan without mm -hmm. any uh, birth parents information, without any, you know, birth families information. And uh, if, when you see, those adopted birth document, mother, the you know the yeah. the line for the box for mother, nothing. The box for father, nothing. And only you know the child's name. So we never know that the name of the child is real or not. Whether the family name is real or not, and the birth date, we never know whether it is true or not. And the address, the address is the address of the adoption agencies. There are four major adoption agencies. Now it is three, but four major adoption agencies until uh, 2000. And they are basically their birth document, birth registration document is not true. Wow. So, so many people, they have no clues to know what is their real origin and or what is their real identity? I guess the tragic thing about that is that if your mother or your father are not there, but then even the state, the government is also willing to let you go. That that seems to be the real heartbreaking aspect of it because anything can happen to families uh, and things like that, but at least we would expect the state. So even when the state does that as well, it becomes... So having experienced that, do people, Korean people that are adopted overseas, having experienced that, that kind of um, sense of abandon where they have been like that and the, the fake documents that you talk about, do they 
feel animosity or anger or do they want to come back? I guess every experience is different, but does that affect their own search or quest for what happened? Yes, that's why that I am saying the right to origin. Mm -hmm. Right to origin means that the this is human rights. It yeah. is the human rights according to the human rights conventions of the United Nations. Yeah. Uh, every human being has the right to know their real identity. Everybody has to, you know, have the right to know what is their real root, where they came from. Yeah. Without, you know, without that, it is not, you know, the identity is not some kind of, you know, struggle or confusion in certain period of time, like uh, when you're teenagers. It is human because it is something that very hard to understand when you know where you are come, where you came from. Mm -hmm. We know who's my mother, who's my father, and what was our, you know, ancestors and what where I came from. Mm -hmm. what kind of family I'm from. This is the fact that I realized after I talked with adoptees, mm -hmm. how they struggle to know where they are coming from. It is, you know, really lifelong struggle when we see them. It is not, you know, they are not happy or they are happy or unhappy or their family was loving family or, you know, not so right. <laughs> being family yeah just the knowledge yeah, they have yes it's about their origin mm. so and it and the struggle or the desire usually became bigger when you have your own child i wonder as well it seems these days there is a focus in in let's say the western world to focus on identity and ethnicity that's become right. part of the big conversation and people champion their their own ethnicity their own identity so that's part of i think of a more broader liberal global movement so that must also be affecting the uh, adopted children in their own search because they need to think right. all of a sudden well what is my one and where do i come from yes yes but just you know think about some people who really have no, they have their official, you know, documents yeah. that they receive from the government of the receiving countries and the government of the sending countries. But those official documents really have nothing to do with their real identity and yeah. real origin. What they should do then? It's like being a detective, isn't it? You have to go on a quest by yourself or... Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and they were you, you re really struggling, you know, they are, uh, you know, individually and for, for personally, they do just whatever they can do. Many people, many adults think that DNA is the only thing they can rely on. So... Is it reliable? Yeah, mm -hmm. there are so many, you know, DNA testing companies in the western society is so different in south korea and the uh, uh, and other countries such as in, in europe or in uh, in the united states especially in united states there are so many companies private companies who can collect uh, dna samples mm -hmm. uh, from individuals and there is and actually you know it is very hard to believe but there are so many stories that uh, uh, adoptees find their relatives or their birth parents through that DNA test. So this is where technology and, and things are actually helping and, and giving them that information, that closure, that knowledge that they want. Yes, but it, it's, 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 you know, so just 100% dependent on the personal lock. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Yeah. Yeah, but if it is human rights, if it is human rights, as I as I said, mm. then it is the state, countries, government's obligation to you know fulfill their human rights, and the the Korean government has the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And also the, you know, the receiving country's government, they have the responsibility to 
help those adoptees get to know their real origin and their real identity. It is not simple, uh, simple thing to say because you know, it, uh, in order to implement such mm. policy, you have to make you know special law, yep. and yeah, really implementable you know policy tools. So, and there is also you know many conflict about uh, the privacy things, like the private privacy of adoptive parents families and privacy of birth parents mm -hmm. and the privacy of adoptees. There are so many things uh, involved. So it is not easy thing to do, but we need to find out. We need to find out. But the problem is that nobody even ever started to considering uh, about this issue. So that is why, you know, we are, I, I really hope to raise the awareness of the public and not only in South Korea, but also mm. in Western countries. In terms of the, the state's responsibility and the organizations, mm -hmm. I also wonder a little bit about citizens. So when, mm -hmm. we, when there was this amount of uh, South Korean young children who weren't on a family register, who had their sort of documents perhaps manufactured and they were then sent abroad, why weren't they adopted by South Koreans in Korea? Why would, and again, I guess that's a very difficult question, but I wonder why they had to go overseas and not to Korean people who could not have their own children or were looking at IVF treatment and such forth. Why was it that they went overseas rather than being adopted here? That is really a tricky question. So it is involved a lot of things. So when I said that adoption is not only adoption, but it is basically the, the, the rights of of the children's issue mm. uh, because you know in order to make such a huge phenomenon of a transnational adoption from south korea you need to distort your birth registration system you need to you know sacrifice your child protection system mm -hmm. and you need to degrade your family law system so it is all connected yeah yeah, that, that is all connected, you know, everything is connected. Birth register system has really, you know, uh, so many problems in South Korea. And actually, uh, the United Nations human rights treaty bodies made huge recommendation to fix the birth registries, registration of South Korea. It is not only those adoption things, but also uh, because of those, you know, basic uh, fundamental flaw of this system, the children born in this country, mm. such as, you know, migration, migrated children mm -hmm. in South Korea, yeah. who cannot register in their, you know, birth, in their, you know, national, nationality countries, mm -hmm. embassies. Many children who really cannot be registered to anywhere, but in South Korea, so at least those children can be registered. Mm -hmm. If they are not registered, they don't exist, you know, as a human being in front of the law, by the law. So in South Korea, in such cases, the migration cho migrated children, they have no way to uh, register, birth registered. And there are so many you know cases the fake birth registration and the children were born but not registers and but a child a person is registered but mm. this person was not really born you know there are so many cases yeah so it's basically the flaw of birth registration system and child protection system was in the hands of private uh, welfare facilities, mm -hmm. child, you know, child welfare facilities and orphanages and, you know, adoption agencies, everything is connected and it is uh, such a huge problem. So when people ask me that what is the most serious and my, what is the most imminent problem uh, about the adoption system, I gave uh, usually, you know, two, I, I raise usually two things. Okay. One is that for the children born in this country at this moment, 
with this uh, fragile system, their security and their safety is really at risk. So we need to fix them. One more thing is that for the adopted people yep. from South Korea, 200,000s, they, their you know, right to know their identity and right to know their origin, that, that these two things are really huge issues. When you talk about the safety, the first one being sort of the safety and the protection of children, recently in South Korea, we saw the the, the, the tragic case of jong in and, and what happened mm. to her as, uh, mm. as a young adopted uh, child and, and then the tragedy that unfolded. How did that affect the conversation or your work or research? Because all of a sudden the whole country was then focused on this, if only for a short while, and then the attention went elsewhere. But I just wondered, did that have any effect on your work, your research, public attitudes? Did it help? Did it hinder? Yeah, it is. It is really difficult that it is only this problem, and mm. and if you fix this part, we can solve. You know, uh, you, you can we can solve everything. It really, you know, such a thing does not happen. Yeah. So yeah, just w one solution can fix everything. Such a thing cannot happen. Right. So just to think about, you know, if a baby's born, but they are not registered, so they don't exist as a person. Mm. Just to think about how risky is the situation. It's it's really interesting to me because I always thought that reality was more important than bureaucracy. Like the real physical existence of who we are was more important than a piece of paper or my government number. I thought that that was just paperwork and people with ties, but what you're suggesting is that that thing, that system, that institution is is life saving and provides existence to many people. You know, the government is keep on announcing that they set up such plans, such basic plans mm. for child welfare or basic plan for you know. Anyway, they say that they set up such policies. What about if those policy? only exists on the paper right yeah which means that if you really cannot guarantee the, the implementation that policy should be able to be implemented real life yeah the ground level right but that, that, that that's not guarantee if you make a law if you pass a law in 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 general uh, in general assembly and if you allocate some amount of a budget for that policy that does not mean that it 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 really it really working. Do politicians need to do more? Then do they need to actually implement? Because when we look at presidential elections and voting, it's all North Korea and missiles and money, not not the lives of young children. I mean, could should politicians be doing more? Can they do more, or is it at a different level? Yeah. How can I, how can I say it? <laughs> how can I say it? I, I, I'm just wondering if politicians can actually solve this problem. If, if there was a politician that ran for president on a platform like this, on a platform of securing the human rights of its own citizens and not economic, not Nambukwange or, or these kind of things, but on that kind, would it get enough attention? Would it get support? Is it possible? Looking at some of your work, you, you had some positions in previous government administrations as well. So I just wondered if you had any insight into that. Yes, uh, we need to be able to set up a real priority. We need to be able to find a real solution. Sometimes, you know, the government say that we can solve this problem with this policy tool. But in many you know, cases, that policy tool is not the real solution mm -hmm. for this problem. We need to you know, have real implementable yeah. policy tools to solve this problem. The first thing is that we need to set up real priority. And in, in many cases, you know, the, the, the Korean, looking back, the, the developing process, economic, growth and the developing process of yeah. historically uh, of South Korea 
the real policy goal, policy goals were in many ways really displaced, I think, that uh, that's something that should not be real priority or you know something that a government should not do that that something something should be solved by you know private uh, mm -hmm. private parties at this moment we really looking back yeah. what we have done so far and then we set up a real priority that the government if you know some mm, there are so many things that the government should do the government that some parts that the government and public authority should take mm -hmm. over such police issues were left to the private yeah. agencies there are so many things i know that this is not only the problem of south korea it happens mm -hmm. everywhere yeah. in the world at least now in South Korea, there's more conversation about it. There's more awareness. It, as you say, it might be coming too slow. There's been many mistakes in the past. South Korea, if we know anything about it, is a country of change and country that can always surprise and do many things. How much does media and culture, so you, you mentioned about sort of having the right policies and also policies that are enacted on the ground level, not just sound bites. Sometimes a lot of focus is on media and i believe narratives can change like people's culture people's minds and so when we see for example sayuri is a single mother raising her children on television i know she's a, a japanese entertainer but very much in the public eye here more and more television programs about sort of divorced people and single parents and is there a cultural shift a, a wider understanding among citizens that's going to accept more the idea of being born out of wedlock being single mothers being not knowing your biological parents is that cultural shift in south korea in your opinion is it happening is it helping you know these days and there are so many yeah. sound bites about uh that uh, the government is doing you know things better one of those one of those uh can I say propaganda? One of those propagandas the government is uh, spreading to this uh, to this society is that government that the Korean society wants to solve the problem of low birth rate. Mm -hmm. Lowest in the OECD, lowest in the world, isn't it? It's incredibly low. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But you know, the low birth rate, the number of birth mm. birth rate can be a policy goal of a government. Yeah, childbirth, yeah, childbirth is 100% yeah. personal decision. Yeah. yeah, that's the decision of women and that's the decision yeah. of a family. Yeah, people do not have child in order to fulfill uh, the policy goal of a government. Governments spend billions of dollars trying to affect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when they say that they uh, set up some goal, goals as, as, as set up some number as a policy goal, and we are going to raise a birth rate to this level, to this level. And what's the purpose of the policy is usually, you know, to fulfill some goals related to economic growth. Yeah. yeah. Rather than the individual choices. Yeah. Yes, that's not, you know, in order to make people mm -hmm. happy. Yeah, it is to make, you know, it is also considering that the, the economic factors of the society, the labor forces, priving, you know, providing labor forces to the society. Right. It's really, I think it's mm -hmm. unethical to use such, you know, to spread such ideas and such words into this society by a government. Totally unethical. The government should not do. If it is a, a really a true government, a government should not do such things. I agree with you 100 percent on that, actually. And I think it seems to be seems to me that in South Korea, more and more people agree with you that when it is revealed that the government has economic policies or or maps of fertility and things like this that have been released, there's been outcry against this because as you say it's it's an individual decision it's it's what happens in private in people's own lives and and that autonomy of the things that we do really shouldn't be impinged on by the government yeah 
So if you give, if you have a child, the government is going to give you money. No, that that should not be the slow any you know the words or slogans. Mm. So and when you see the media mm. reporting about child, about the childhood, mm. about the children and the family, it is you know the child is always considered as a burden for a mom, for a mom and for you know the family. The child should not be treated like that. It is a human being. So it so you know the the worst thing about human rights is objectification. You objectify a human being, then it is almost you, you know you are making a human being yeah. a commodity who does not have any subjective personality. But in this society, the media and the government and the public opinion leaders, they are spreading such ideas. They see a human being as an object, mm. as a commodity. It is not only, you know, the in, in the about issues of adoption or you know mm. child welfare, but basically this is about what this society, how this society is see a person, a human being, how to treat a human being. Even sometimes I'm guilty of that. I try not to be, but I talk about groups or i talk about people like talking about adopted children as a as a collective group rather than talking to them or talking about women or to, rather than talking to these people and hearing their voices you know and and allowing each voice to rise up it feels to me that society is moving that way that we're creating or south korea and, and the world more generally is creating a place where people do have the ability through technology and 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 also democracy i mean you can kind of say what you want in south korea now whether it's political gender religious and so on it's it's doing well so i i hope that those people will speak up and you know the the voices of of the people that have adopted been adopted and all those involved will rise into the public consciousness a little bit more yes that is so true that's so true we just you know set up some images of a good family a good family should be able to provide a child with such mm. and such things. Yeah, so we should really advise, you know, avoid stereotype or typical things that should happen in your family or in mm. your life. And if such things that happen in your life, you, you know, make, you know, the society is really uh, going to one direction that if you are going to be a successful or happy life you should have you know such such things so and if you don't have such things in your life you tend to consider yourself as yeah. failure or unhappy we are saying according to the official mm -hmm. statistics transnationally intercountry adoptees were more than 90 more than 90 percent were children of unwed mothers, young and unwed mm -hmm. mothers. If you were born in this country by an unwed mothers, you are very likely to be separate from your birth parents right after the birth and transferred overseas to be a child of another family of another country which is so sad because there shouldn't be anything wrong with you know the, the, the child hasn't done anything wrong the, the, the mother it, it's not a crime really it shouldn't be it shouldn't be viewed that way you shouldn't be abandoned by family or even the state just for that situation yes yes and it is it, so so you know obvious in according to the official statistics official statistics, official numbers. When you see, you know, as I said, that uh, Korean birth record, birth registration is categorized as birth within the wedlock and birth out of wedlock. When you see the official st statist, birth, the birth report mm. out of a wedlock is like, you know, until recently, I checked, when I checked those numbers, until recently, it's less than 5%. But, you know, I think that, when you see this 
country, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the reality of the of Korean society. Birth out of wedlock is one, two, or less than 5%. I think that's not weird. I don't think that's weird. Because of the flaw of birth registration system, or, you know, you can make a fake birth registration, so there must Mm -hmm. be something that is happening in reality. So the numbers aren't true. People are hiding it, or it's not... It's ignoring those people that are born like that. The number must be much higher than, you know, 5% because South Korean, they're, they're just people like anywhere else in the world, but it's not reflected in the statistics, not reflected in the numbers. I hope it gets better. I, I just wonder if what happens next, does it get better? How does it get better? What What do we do? That's a really ridiculously big question, I know, but what happens next? Wow. Because, you know, uh, recently, that, that is really a question that <laughs> I am not really ready for. <laughs> because, you know, I was uh, really focusing on talking about what yeah. was wrong uh, in the past. Because that what we did wrong in the past is affecting yeah. the present. Yeah. So I, I was really focusing on reveal the truth, what happened in the past. So what are what we should do? Uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, about rectifying the process to rectify what happened in the past, we usually say three mm-hmm. processes, truth, justice, and reparation. Truth, justice, and reparation. Truth means that we have to know what really happened, what was the truth. So it needs very close investigation on the uh, official authorities and the, the private uh, bodies like adoption agencies or other you know, orphanages or child welfare facilities because these are all private entities in South Korea. So we need some special measures to implement thorough investigation what really happened inside those private entities justice which means that we need to know who and which organization is accountable for mm-hmm. what now without without this justice uh, process i don't think that reconciliation is possible people you know tend to say about the reconciliation you know you just do, maybe just do, you know forgive what happened in the past and we just move forward for the better future, you know, kind of things. But without this truth yeah. and justice process, just yeah. things moving toward better future is not possible. And what is the reparation? It still needs further discussion. What is the real reparation for those people who are deprived of their true origin and identities by systematic uh, process of the government? Basic process to rectify what happened in the past, but we really didn't uh, have chance to start even the first step. When you talk about reparation, do you mean my mind immediately goes to financial reparations? Is there something else? Is there another aspect of that, like granting nationality or citizenship, or is there something other than sort of financial reparations? Think about, you know, what happened in South Africa after the apartheid, you know, uh, such a, you know, tragic history and what they have done is Truth and Reconciliation Commission and for reparation, there are so many things that they can do, not only, you know, for financial, you know, uh, aspects, but also we can, you know, take measures to remember, remember what he have done so far and never repeat uh, such things in the future. So those things were can be considered as part of reparation. It's very easy for a country to look at other countries and say what other countries have done wrong, whether it's involving in war, colonization, human rights. It's much harder for a country to acknowledge what it has done wrong. It doesn't matter what country it is. Um, but is South Korea ready to do that? Is South Korean society ready to look at what it did wrong to its own We people? already did it. Like, you know, Gwangju massacre and, you know, there's in, yeah. and other uh, civilian massacres during the Civil War, Korean War. 
and we that we yeah we you know yeah, it was also yeah. 20 years ago and 10 years ago we the we set up some uh truth committee truth special committee to do some investigation yeah. and also deciding yeah. the le the level of reparation for those for the victims we do have experiences mm -hmm. but the problem is that we think that it is not only South Korea, but other parts of many Asian countries, we tend to think that confuse democracy, democratization, and human rights. And if you, yeah, if your country become, you know, I received made some questions like, you know, yes, that is uh, about, about the transnational issue. Some people tend to ask me, Mm -hmm. uh, used to ask me that, uh, yes, it was the problem of the authoritarian military regime, but after the Korean society became democratized, uh, like the President Kim Dae-jung and Noh Hyun, you know, it's getting better, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The truth is, no. It just, you know, <laughs> the, the trend so there are some changes. There are some changes, but not exactly for a better way. Yep. We never think that democratic uh, government uh, decides that this country is democratic country and this country is not democratic country because, you know, these days every country is claiming that uh, they are democratic government. But democratization does not guarantee uh, human rights. Yeah, agreed. And I guess sometimes the process is, there's priorities and orders. So in South Korea, sort of ideology and democracy and communism, and that has sort of taken priority. That's been at the forefront. And also the, the colonization with sort of sympathizers or Chinilpa, they, they all sort of seem to rise to the top of truth and reconciliation commissions, whether it's with Jeju, Gwangju, but the other ones, that what you're focusing on, an adoption and these people abandoned are, are way down the list of priorities there, it seems, in the politician's eyes. Uh, the really, you know, critical uh, litmus test about the notion of human rights that divide between the older generation and younger generation, I think it is the uh, their uh, uh, understanding about LGBTI rights. Yeah, for, you know, uh, younger generation, I mean, uh, 20s and early 30s, they truly think it is no doubt that mm -hmm. that is human rights. But, you know, for yeah. older generation, uh, many people's very, you know, respected uh, so-called member of civil society of South Korea, some people... <laughs> say <laughs> really that uh, that rather that this issue is not rather you know culture <laughs> thing than human rights well they use what did shigi sangjo like let's talk about it later they they delay the conversation so kyungan how did you because we've no disrespect to your age obviously you might not be in your 20s and 30s how did you come to understand that then <laughs> Are you asking that how do I know LGBT right is human right? <laughs> yeah, because you just said it's a generation thing. And I agree with you that many young people take it for granted. They don't question it, whether they, Yodang, Yadang, ruling party. Know, it's yeah. just kind of that. <laughs> yeah. But it's harder for the older generation. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious, how did, uh, what was your journey like with that? What is, what was my journey about the human rights? Wow. Well, oh. Specifically, I guess, with LGBT yeah. in Korea. Yeah. I just, I think I just know that. I didn't have any, you know, confusion or any, you know, struggle <laughs> to accept mm -hmm. the concept that LGBTI rights is human rights. I think it is. Yeah. yeah, for me, it was so natural. I think that because I learned <laughs> international human rights norms or, you know, international human rights law, or yeah, I, I was always, you know, focusing on this issue for, for many years in my life. And I basically consider myself as 
an international law scholar. So maybe that's why. Education helps, I guess, yeah. Right. That's... Yeah, wow. <laughs> that's the power of education, right? With me personally, I found it's always been necessary to keep updating myself. So it's not about what was right or wrong when I was 15 or 20 or 25, because attitudes change. So it's not about, I think, telling people you're wrong, but it's more about sort of saying to people, well, maybe update once in a while. Like we have to update our phones and, and things like that. Sometimes we get stuck in this right or wrong attitude, but it's more about understanding change because ideas and values are changing all the time. So it's about staying up to date which is hard, but yeah. that's how I try to do it. Yeah, that's all right. Do people reach out to you? I mean, how I've seen your, your articles, your columns, and actually somebody emailed me about my columns asking for you, asking for your email address. And they, they reached out to me, and, and that's why I sort of became more aware of what you were doing. So just to bring it sort of background full circle, like... Uh, those articles in the press, they had an effect. They, they they connected with people. They reached. Yes, but most of the people who are reaching out to me are adopted. Adoptees. Yeah. yeah. But I would rather, because, you know, I when I finished my uh, thesis, PhD, that it was the issue of my, you know, the PhD dissertation is about the intercountry adoption. And uh, Korea is such a, you know, the biggest, biggest sending country in the world history. But my PhD dissertation was the first and only, first and only thesis, PhD thesis in mm. Seoul National University's School of Law. Yeah, first and only, which means that there are not really uh, many uh, research background or found foundations in this country. I did really a lot of interviews since 2017 because I finished this dissertation 2017 and I did a lot of in-media interviews and I, all, I also published the book public you know, for public uh, general people, but it really did not draw much attention as, as I you know, expect. Uh, mm. as much attention as I expect from Korean society. That's why I decided that I should write about it in English and reach out to adoptive community who are really uh, firsthand, direct, direct right orders on this issue. Yeah. But I am not really uh, talking about uh, it as an individual and personal issue, but as a policy and state's obligations. Mm. So, I am expecting, I am expecting the responses from the government of the receiving countries mm -hmm. because those governments are the governments of adoptees. They are all foreigners in South Korea, but they have some interest about their rights, about their human rights in South Korea but they don't have nationality or citizenship inside South Korea, but they are citizens of very powerful countries in the world. Yeah. So I hope, I hope uh, the countries, the powerful countries, and uh, many of them say that uh, their diplomatic and national interests, their diplomatic goal is not only their national interest, but overall human rights. So please do something. Yeah, this is my goal to write this issue in English. You know, it is really hard because English is not my first language. So it is really hard to do some lectures or write articles in English, but I think this is the only way to spread the idea and uh, make some changes on this issue. You're a genuine pioneer with your research, and uh, I can't guarantee that powerful countries will do anything, but I, I know, though, I yeah, yeah, because, you know, I saw that how they treat this issue. They, you know, once they heard 
about it, it, it does not mean that I didn't have any opportunity to talk to those countries. I mean, the embassies or mm. somebody involved with, uh, yeah, in those countries involved with this issue, who are in charge of this issue. Literally, they turned deaf ears and blind eyes. I was kind of shocked. Is that not the problem with human rights, that they're always politicized? We see it, I think, sometimes with, with attitudes towards China or with North Korea. We, we use human rights or people use human rights as a, as a catchphrase or as a soundbite to fulfill their own political goals or policies rather than the actual fundamental idea underneath it all. Because it, it, maybe it's actually impossible. To, it, it's very hard to believe in those human rights. Yes, yes, that's it. So sometimes I think that I'm really crazy. Why I am doing this, <laughs> you know, kind of feeling <laughs> that I can I can do something better, you know. But <laughs> why I am doing this? But I'm the, yeah. That's the question that I always ask to myself. I still I feel I am. Uh, it's part of my obligation because. I am the person who knows about it. Mm. It's it's definitely touching some people, though. That's the thing, you know. Whether, and it, it's going beyond yourself, and it, it it's supporting those people that haven't been supported. It's 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 an example, I think, for other people to look at and see that, you know, you, you might be crazy, but there's nothing wrong with being crazy sometimes in a world like this. I think we all need to be a little bit crazy. I, I think if we're more like you, then the world's going in a good place. And, you know, in, in, in the world, in the world, there are quite a few, quite a few crazy adoptees, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and <laughs> I, I told them, I talked to them, said, yeah, crazy people make changes. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. yeah, yeah, crazy people yeah. make changes. Absolutely. I'm going to finish the conversation there. That's going to be the last thing that I put on the, on the podcast, Kyungan. Like crazy people make changes, then it will finish. <laughs>